Uh, Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Then Jesus called the crowd and said to them, Listen and understand. What makes someone unclean isn't what goes into the mouth, it's what comes out of the mouth that makes someone unclean. Then the disciples came to Jesus. Do you know, they said, that the Pharisees were horrified when they heard what you said? Every plant that my heavenly Father hasn't planted, replied Jesus, will get plucked up by the roots. Let them be. They are blind guides. But if one blind person guides another, both of them will fall into a pit. Peter spoke up. Explain the riddle to us, he said. Are you still slow on the uptake as well, replied Jesus? Don't you understand that whatever goes into the mouth travels on into the stomach and goes out into the toilet? But what comes out of the mouth begins in the heart, and that's what makes someone unclean. Out of the heart, you see, come evil plots, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemy. These are the things that make someone unclean. But eating with unwashed hands doesn't make a person unclean. Jesus left that place and went off into the district of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman came from those parts and shouted, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is demon-possessed. She's in a bad way. Jesus, however, said nothing at all to her. His disciples came up. Please send her away, they said. She's shouting after us. I was only sent, replied Jesus, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman, however, came and threw herself down at his feet. Master, she said, please help me. It isn't right, replied Jesus, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. I know, master, but even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from their master's table. You've got great faith, haven't you, my friend, replied Jesus. All right, let it be as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful story. Can be a confusing story. Can be a troubling story. And we want to talk about all of that uh, today. Uh, many, or I think all of you, were, were with me in another church four years ago. And I, I taught a series called uh, Jesus the Transformer. And I addressed this story then in that series. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of draw on that message. So some of this may be familiar to you, but I'll uh, add a few things. And I think it's, it's worthwhile revisiting it. Anyway, it is the lectionary gospel text for today. But also to revisit it because it is such a misunderstood passage, I think. And it lends itself to being misunderstood when all you do is read, read the text. Uh, Jesus was a transformative figure, the way he taught, the way he lived, the way he died, the way he overcame death, all of those things are transformative. They, they uh, awaken our imagination to things that were not possible before. Um, he was also transformative in how he handled scripture. His scripture, of course, was what we call the Old Testament today. Uh, many people see the scripture as a rule book or as a constitution. Uh, you have uh, people politically that say they're constitutionalists, meaning they, they adhere to, the strict, uh, to a strict understanding of uh, the U.S. Constitution. There are, peop- there are people, Christians, that adhere to the Bible that way, as if it was our Constitution as well. But Jesus didn't treat it that way. He treated it more like a story, more like a, a narrative. Uh, and he, he appeared in the middle of this particular story. So in that series, I... I, uh, I use the idea of the Bible as a drama, as an unfolding story, as an unfolding drama. And we talked about it as this way, like a six-act play. Uh, you could say Act 1 was the creation story, Act 2, uh, the fall, Act 3, the, story, the early story of Israel, because Israel's story is continuing to be written today. So, uh, but the, those... those uh, Old Testament books tell us the early story of Israel. Act 4 would be the story of Jesus, when Jesus appears in the middle of this whole drama. Act 5, the story of the church, where we live today. And Act 6, the coming new creation. Uh, Different scholars address the Bible as drama with different numbers of acts, like um, uh, N.T. Wright uh, uses a five-act play to to, uh, describe it. I'm choosing to use the six-act play model that uh, Dr. Sylvia Kiesmat uses as well. So we're actors in this story today. The story is still going on. It's still unfolding. It's still being written. We are characters in the story in Act 
5. So we still have a role to play. So we have to pay attention to where we are in the narrative. Like if you've ever uh, taken part in dramas or you know uh, plays, maybe you're a character that doesn't appear until the middle uh, acts of the play. Well, if that's the case, then you wouldn't land in the middle of the play and start acting like somebody in the first act or the second act of the play, right? So we, being characters in the fifth act of this play, need to be aware of that, that we, we reside in a particular location in this whole narrative. We're not entering in act one. That's already been played, the creation story. We're not entering in Act 2. We're still feeling the effects of Act 2, but we're not playing a role in Act 2. We're not entering into Act 3, the historical story of Israel and God's covenant dealings with Israel. That all plays out in Act 3. It includes the formation of Israel with Abraham, the captivity in Egypt, the exodus, the wilderness, the conquest uh, stories, the various exiles, the restorations. All of that happens in Act 3. And we also don't enter the story in Act 4. Something really important, though, happens in Act 4. The leading man shows up. (laughs) The the primary character in this story, Jesus, uh, comes and is revealed to us in Act 4. God makes an entrance into into the play, into the narrative, in the form of a human. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us there in Act 4. So in Act 1, God was the central character. When we read those creation narratives, we see God as the central character. In Acts 2 and 3, God plays an important role, but he's backstage. He's not the central uh, uh, character on the stage in Acts 2 and 3. He's backstage, behind the scenes, if you will. Or in biblical language, he is behind a veil. This is how Paul describes it in, in 2 Corinthians. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. So in Act 3, God played a part, but he appeared behind a veil. He wasn't uh, uh, really apparent. Moses got close enough to God that it says he, he wore a veil to keep uh, or to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. What was passing away? Act 3 was passing away. But they weren't able to see at that point, the end of Act 3. They were characters in Act 3, but they couldn't, they couldn't quite see into Act 4. And then Paul goes on in verse 14, but their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. So the veil that concealed God in Act 3 is taken away in Act 4. But only some people will will comprehend what that means. Uh, like my experience when I watch, anybody seen the movie in- Inception? It's about a, a dream within a dream within another dream. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw that movie, I got lost. About halfway through the movie, I got lost. Where, I, well, where are we in all of these dreams within dreams within dreams? I had to see it a second time, and then uh, it started to make sense. But in that first viewing, my mind was dull. <laughs> Just like this, is, like this says here, their minds were made dull. I just couldn't comprehend it. I, w- I got lost in the narrative. I got, nos- I got lost in, even though the acts were playing out in front of me, my perception was veiled. I couldn't understand them. I had to go back and view it a second time, and then I was able to follow what was going on. So the Old Covenant, or Act 3, uh, the Old Covenant Act 3 way of understanding God behind the veil has been transformed in Act 4 when Christ comes. Uh, Verse 15, even to this day, though, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is really important. In order to turn to the Lord, you must turn away from something else. Like if I turn to Liam, I've turned away from Tara and Joe. It's, it's inescapable. When I turn to one person, I, by necessity, turn away from someone else. So what Paul is really saying here, when he says, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So in Act 4, we must turn to the Lord, which means of necessity we must turn away from Moses. It doesn't mean we discard Moses doesn't mean we devalue Moses. We just recognize that Moses is an Act 3 character. 
and that if we read Moses as if we were in Act 3, we're still going to have a veil over our understanding. Jesus even validated the importance of Moses and Elijah and other Old Testament characters. Of course, at the Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus. But also at the Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah fade away into the mist, and Jesus is the one remaining standing. In other words, you can't understand the whole story of the Bible unless you turn to the leading man. Give your attention to the man who makes this entrance in Act 4. If we don't turn toward Jesus and away from Moses and Elijah, our understanding will remain veiled. Doesn't mean we discard them. We're not Marcionites. We don't reject Moses and Elijah, but we understand that they played an important role in Act 3 in pointing us forward to the coming of the Messiah. But we can no longer read Moses and Elijah or, or any of the Old Testament as if the leading man hasn't come. Because once we've turned to the Lord, we have a different perspective on those Old Testament texts. So what this means is that we, in Act 5, can no longer go back and read the story of the Bible as if we're in Act 3. Or even as if we're in Act 4. Because Act 4 was a transitory act. Act 4 was this time when uh, we read it, especially in Paul, where he, sa- he speaks of things passing away, but they're not completely gone yet. So this, this whole period of from the birth of Jesus until AD 70 was a transitory time. That, that was all Act 4, if you think of it that way. Uh, so we're not any longer living in Act 4 either. That, that should influence the way we read some of the Act 4 texts, even some of the ways that Jesus speaks. We don't have to assume that everything that Jesus said is a prescription for us today in Act 5 because Jesus was playing a particular role in Act 4 when he came. It was a transitory role. It was, it was moving them out of the story of, uh, of Israel as they understood it into a, a radically a, a redefined or reoriented view of God and creation. Only in turning to Jesus as the transformative, full, and complete image of God can we keep our faces unveiled. All right, then uh, finally, uh, Paul says in uh, verse 18, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We're not going to be transformed into the image of the Lord by living in Act 3 or by reading the Bible, all of the Bible, as if we're in Act 3. That means you can't use Act 3 text to trump Act 4 and 5 understanding. You can't go back and snatch a text out of Act 3 and say, yeah, I know Jesus said this, but, or I know Jesus said to love your enemies, but Moses said or Elijah said. No, you can't do that. You can't let Act 1, 2, or 3 texts in the Bible trump Act 4 and 5 texts. <laughs> I mean, people do it all the time, but I'm saying you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, okay. With that kind of as our foundation, let's move on uh, a little bit farther. So, in Deuteronomy 7, Act 3 now, we read, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations... Everybody remember seven nations, more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. This is an Act 3 text. And and Moses here is referring to seven nations. Collectively, all these ites nations, collectively they're called Canaan, the land of Canaan. Canaan was actually one of the seven nations, but we, we often refer to all of these seven nations as Canaan land. They were considered unclean nations and idolatrous. They ate what the Jews considered to be unclean. They ate pork, they ate shellfish, they mixed their, uh, dairy with their meat. All these, uh, these restrictions that the Jews had the Canaanites didn't have on what they ate. So the Jews looked at them and said, you guys, you have an unclean diet, you, you worship idols, and they considered them defiled or unclean. Now this story can be troubling. Why? Because Moses instructs the Israelites to completely destroy the people in Canaan, to make no covenant with them and to have no mercy 
on them. Now, growing up in the church, I just read this as another story in the Bible. I didn't think about much. I just, that's what God ordered through Moses, so that's the way it was. But today we have a name for this. When this happens, when a nation goes into another nation and completely destroys it, we call it genocide. You know, this is, so scholars are beginning to call this, this part of Israel's Act 3 story the Canaanite genocide or the Canaanite conquest. If they're not quite ready to go and call it a, a genocide, they'll call it a conquest. Uh, but I, I think if we, if we apply our modern day understanding of genocide to it, we can say, yeah, that looks like a genocide. So stories like this in the Bible have been problematic for a lot of people, it's particularly in America. To Native Americans, this is a very problematic text because it, it would bring up to Native Americans the remembrance of how the Europeans treated them when they came to the United States. And actually the Europeans claimed manifest destiny and this doctrine of discovery from the Pope as authority to come in and commit genocide against Native Americans. So you can see how it might be tough to present this as part of the good news of the gospel to Native Americans. <laughs> It's kind of hard to swallow. By the same token, uh, uh, African Americans could see this text as, as being problematic. So it's, I think it's good. I think, I think it's okay to allow tr stories like this in Act 3 to trouble us. I think we should not, living in Act 5, just assume that everything that happened in Act 3 is a prescription for today, just because it's in the story. So that brings us to this, uh, the text that Sherry Ann read for us today. It's the story about the Canaanite woman that came and asked Jesus to have mercy on her daughter who was demon-possessed. I love this painting. It's a little bit grainy. Sorry, because I couldn't find a big uh, uh, example of it. But I love in, in the story, you see the Canaanite woman there begging uh, Jesus uh, to heal her daughter. But you see, and you see around maybe some Pharisees and other people, and then Jesus' disciples there uh, that he's looking at. I love that Jesus is looking or drawing his attention to his own disciples, not to the Canaanite woman. And we'll ex understand this, or I'll see what, uh, you'll see what I'm getting at as we work through it. But just kind of keep this image in mind of the encounter. And in this, in this particular painting, Jesus' attention is toward his disciples rather than toward the woman who's uh, crying out for help for, from him. And we'll quickly read the story again. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Lord, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. Let that sink for a minute. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was, only, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire, and her daughter was healed instantly. So in this story, a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus and begs him to heal her daughter of demon uh, possession or oppression. What Jesus in the story says can seem like he's being indifferent or uncaring about her plight. He actually refers to her as a dog. Yet he ultimately heals her daughter at the end of the story. So the end of the story is not so troubling. It's the narrative leading up to what he ultimately does that's kind of problematic. Was Jesus a sexist? Was he racist? I mean, this was a woman. She was from a, a different nationality. Was he having a bad day? What, what was going on here that he responds in this way? Uh, we see from other stories that Jesus definitely was not sexist. He, he uh, treated women very fairly and, and as equals in many other stories. He wasn't racist. We see that in other places, but this, kind of, this story kind of throws us. So first, I want to draw attention to the fact that Matthew identifies this woman as a Canaanite. Now, this, the, the way that most people at the time 
spoke of Canaanites was not as Canaanites but as Syrophoenicians. So if you read Mark's account of this story, his account calls the woman a Syrophoenician. I went to uh, uh, Iceland a few years back and the people in Iceland, for I don't know what the reason, don't refer to themselves today as Vikings. <laughs> but they're descended from Vikings. It's the same uh, idea. In this case, uh, for Matthew to use the word or to identify her as a Canaanite would, would do the same thing as if I was talking about modern day uh, Icelandic citizens and I called them Vikings. It would immediately make you think of their heritage or think about what, you know, what happened many years ago. And I think that's what Matthew is doing here. He's drawing our attention not to the fact that she's a modern day Syrophoenician, but that she has a lineage to ancient Canaan. The land that Moses told the disciples, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Israelites to have no mercy on. So I think Matthew is deliberately drawing our attention not to the woman uh, only, but to her ancient Canaanite origins. This is the Canaan that was seen as the enemy of Israel in Act 3. It was the Canaan that the Israelites were to utterly destroy and to have no mercy upon in Act 3. But now in Act 4, a Canaanite woman, who was considered an enemy of Israelites, comes pleading with Jesus to have mercy. Moses had told them to have no mercy on the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the arch enemies of Israel in Act 3. Now in Act 4, what will Jesus, also an Israelite, do? So four years ago, we dramatized this story. We, we did it two ways. I had a few people, I think Maynard might have helped me with it. I can't remember now. But anyway, we had several people come up and play different characters in this story. And the first dramatization, we did straight up. We had Jesus and, uh, looking at the woman and responding to her uh, as if he was speaking exactly what he meant. Like, like he was meaning what to say. So in other words, the woman came and said, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And Jesus just stood there and looked at her, didn't say a thing. And then after a brief pause of not saying anything, the disciples come in and they say, send her away for she's crying out after us. Then Jesus looks at the woman and says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman responds, Lord, help me. And Jesus, seeming to just heap a scorn on her, says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. The woman responds to Jesus, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus then says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. So that's one way to read that story, to act it out. Another way is different. And... Uh, what we did at this time is the Jesus character, which I think was me, uh, played it differently. And instead of responding directly to the woman in each time, I directed my attention to the disciples, just like this painting does. And the story would, would go more like this. The woman would come and say, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And then Jesus still is silent, doesn't say a thing. Then the disciples come in and say, send her away. She's crying out after us. And then Jesus turning to this, the disciples says, yeah, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman cries out, Lord, help me. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, that's not right for, uh, for us to take the, uh, the, the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And then the woman says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus turns to her and says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. So what I'm doing there is, is, is turning this episode around from a straight up dialogue, a straight up sincere conversation between Jesus and the woman and the disciples into a satire. Where Jesus, I'm proposing, uses satire in this case to try to teach his disciples a lesson. Um, so we have to think about the context of this. Just before this story, in Matthew 15 and also in Mark 7, where it's also recorded, Jesus was teaching his disciples about what makes a person unclean. Sherry Ann read that passage to us this morning. He was teaching them that what 
makes someone unclean is what comes out of their mouth, not what comes into them, not what they consume. So when Jesus doesn't respond to the woman's request to heal her daughter, I don't think he was ignoring her. I think he was deliberately waiting to see what his disciples would say because he had just finished teaching them about who is unclean and who is clean. In that teaching, he didn't name Canaanites specifically, but it was a global teaching about you know, what causes a person to be defiled and what doesn't. The, the Pharisees had been complaining about his disciples not washing their hands before they ate. Well, it wasn't because the Pharisees were concerned about hygiene. They had no concept of hygiene at that point. It was only in the, in the recent history that we've even had a concept that if dirty hands you know, transfer disease. So the Pharisees were not concerned with hygiene when they criticized Jesus' disciples uh, for not washing their hands. They were concerned with ritual purity, with doing things that were identity markers for them that they saw as ways to separate themselves from Gentiles, from Canaanites, and, uh, and, and others, other non-Jewish people. So I think what's happening here is when that woman, in the text actually, you get a sense in the text, uh, Yeah, it comes right. It comes right behind uh, uh, that that teaching, and as they and there goes my water. As it goes, he's waiting to see what the disciples will say. And here it comes: send her away, for she's crying out after us. Fail. <laughs> if you had the gong on the gong show, you'd gong them at that point. So Jesus waits to see if his disciples understood anything he'd just been teaching them and their response reveals that they didn't understand it at all. So at that point, Jesus could just have corrected them straight up. He could have just corrected them. Haven't you guys been hearing what I've been telling you? But I'm proposing that he didn't do that. I'm proposing he shifted and started playing the role that his disciples just played in order to point out satirically that they weren't getting it. In the first drama I spoke of, Jesus speaks to the woman in a sincere way, and that's the way many people read this. And they try to make sense of Jesus' seemingly uncaring, uh, even cruel statements to the woman. I'm proposing that Jesus really wasn't directing his comments to the woman. He was directing his comments to his disciples who had already revealed what was in their heart through what came out of their mouths. Send her away, she's bugging us. She's just a Canaanite. She's, she's one of these people we don't have anything to do with because they're unclean, in other words. So Jesus then, instead of just correcting him again, because I get a feeling like he's been down this road a time or two, and they, they, their hard-heartedness, their hard-headedness, he's encountered, and we see it all through the gospel stories. He, instead, he jumps into character with them and starts to, uh, to talk to them in the same tone, the same merciless attitude that they were demonstrating toward the woman. But then after doing that for a couple of times, the woman's reply, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, revealed what was in her heart. (laughs) An astounding humility and awareness of who Jesus was. Do you remember what she called him when she first spoke to him? Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She's a Canaanite addressing Jesus as if, he, as if she were a Jew. She is bought into who Jesus is, even though she's not a Jew. She's bought into him, and she addresses him as the Lord, the son of David, recognizing his lineage coming from David. And throughout the dialogue, she, she speaks to him as Lord. And I think when Jesus heard that, when he heard what came out of her mouth, which revealed what was in her heart, which is the whole teaching he had just been uh, trying to get through to his disciples, he couldn't stay in character anymore. He couldn't keep playing that role. And he says, how great is this, is your faith? Be it done for you as you desire. She just showed up the disciples. A lot of commentators think this is a, this whole story is Jesus testing the woman's faith. And there, are, there is evidence that rabbis at this time would, would oftentimes refuse the request of a would-be student three times 
in order to test the resolve of that student to see if they were serious about wanting to become a disciple of that rabbi. So some people would look at this story and say they think that might have been what ha was happening. Jesus was just testing her faith. But I, I think this is a better way to look at it, and we can, we can discuss it after. Satire was well known and, and used all throughout the Roman Empire at this time. We have evidence that it was uh, used both by Romans and Greeks at least 300 years before Jesus. Uh, if you've studied any Greek uh, theater or, or Roman theater, satire is a common element of Roman and, and Greco-Roman uh, theater from the time before and after uh, that Jesus lived. Uh, Horace and uh, Juvenal were well-known Roman satirists before the time of Jesus. So, but I think there's another way that we know that Jesus wasn't actually being sincere and serious in these two problematic statements that he makes to the, to the woman here. When Jesus says, I was sent only, not first, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, we know that's not true because John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The mission of Jesus was not to the Jews only. It was to the whole world, right? And also when Jesus says it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, we know that that's not true either because in John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And, who, and, uh, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus is the bread for whoever believes in him, Jew or Gentile. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Peter Fitch, I think, captures what's going on here. He writes this, perhaps Jesus is reflecting the prejudices of his age, which is what the straight up telling would, would imply, but I doubt it. Instead, I think it's more likely that he is saying out loud, either for her sake or for the disciples who are watching, what everyone believes. He is bringing the hidden darkness into the light of day by speaking openly and honestly about the broken relationships between Jews and Gentiles. He is naming the curse and then he shatters it by honoring the woman and by healing her daughter. So I don't think Jesus was ignoring the Canaanite woman. I think he was trying to give his disciples an opportunity to practice what he'd just been teaching them. But when they failed the test, Jesus sarcastically plays along with them in order to expose their merciless Act 3 attitudes. The disciples were ready to sacrifice any kind of relationship with this poor woman. She had no reason to think that a Jew would help her, but Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, right? Some see this story as Jesus cruelly testing the woman, but I think it's really a test of his disciples. I don't think he's really testing the woman. I think he's testing his poor disciples who still couldn't quite get what he was trying to teach them. Here in Act 4, Jesus throws open wide the kingdom of God to a woman who was shown no mercy in Act 3. But he shows her great mercy here in Act 4. Now let's just zoom out a little bit because we've been focusing pretty much on this story and look at the contextual sequence of events surrounding this story in both Matthew and Mark, because uh, both Matthew and Mark uh, tell this story and they tell the context almost uh, uh, the same way. So if we back up just a little bit, both Matthew and Mark record Jesus feeding the 5,000. We spoke about that last week, about how after John the Baptist had been executed, uh, his followers followed Jesus out into the desert uh, rather than rally those people against Herod who had taken uh, John's life, Jesus begins healing them and then he feeds them and then he sends them home. So he, he's not acting like a typical political leader who would uh, try to rally people against an, a great injustice. So the first uh, event in this sequence in both of these gospels is that 5,000 people were fed and in that first instance 12 basketfuls were left over. Then Jesus teaches in both places about what you say making you unclean, not what you consume making you unclean, which is a clear, I think it's a clear teaching about 
hey, the, th- the reason you guys, you Jews, keep yourself separate from uh, the rest of the world is bogus. <laughs> it's not, I mean, maybe it played a role in Act 3, but it's time for that to come, up, to come down in Act 4, right? Then Jesus has this encounter with the Canaanite uh, woman. After that, in Mark's uh, gospel, Jesus heals a deaf mute Gentile. In, uh, in Matthew's gospel, he heals a bunch of people. And then he feeds 4,000, and seven back basketfuls of, of food are left over. So let me just review what's going on here. The 5,000 that he fed were Jewish people. And there were 12 baskets full left over. Most scholars see this, the symbology in those 12 baskets, meaning the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, drawing our attention to the fact that these were, this was a Jewish audience that he fed, that the 12 baskets left over, putting us in remembrance of the 12 tribes. Jesus' 12 disciples are, are a continuation of that, that way of thinking. The disciples were there, were active in that, in that miracle. Uh, Then Jesus teaches about what makes you clean and unclean, trying to transform his disciples' thinking from Act 3 thinking that the Canaanites are evil and unclean into Act 4 thinking. Then this Canaanite woman comes on. It's a a perfect opportunity for the disciples to demonstrate whether they understand what he's been teaching them or not. So Jesus allows them to speak first. They blow it, and then Jesus plays along. Uh, I think that probably would make that a much more memorable lesson to them the way Jesus encountered it with satire than it would have been if he just said, hey, you idiot, so you got it wrong again. You know, so it's, uh, it, satire can be more memorable is what I'm trying to say. Then Jesus goes on to the Decapolis. We see, and I don't think Matthew describes it that way, but Mark does. He identifies where Jesus goes next to the Decapolis, which is, Decapolis means 10 cities, and this was a Gentile region of cities along the Sea of Galilee. So there are 10 Gentile cities, and Jesus, again, makes his way into Gentile territory right after this. So do you see what's happening in this context from the feeding of the 5,000 Jews then to the the teaching about what makes you clean and unclean, erasing the distinction between Jews and Gentiles? Then Jesus actually heals a, a Gentile Canaanite girl. Then he goes into a Gentile region and heals a deaf mute. The way he heals the deaf mute, though, is interesting. Often, like with the, with the Canaanite uh, woman, he just told the woman, your faith is, uh, uh, let, your faith, uh, let it be done unto you according to your faith. So he just heals with a word there. But when he encounters this deaf mute in the region of the Decapolis, he doesn't just say, be healed. He puts his fingers into the ears of the deaf mute. And he spits, it's, it seems like, on his fingers and touches the man's tongue with his own spittle and heals the man that way. Which in the eyes of the Pharisees and probably even his disciples would have made him an unclean, that encounter, that intimate encounter with a Gentile would have made Jesus unclean. But he intentionally chooses to heal this Gentile, deaf mute, in the most intimate of ways that would probably make a lot of those people just squirm. Because they were so uh, prejudiced against Syrophoenicians and Gentiles. So Jesus is acting out in ways that probably would have been very objectionable to many of his own people. And then he goes and feeds 4,000 Gentiles in this Decapolis region. And this time, seven basketfuls are left over. Well, what does seven remind you about when we're thinking about Canaanites? It reminds me of the seven cities that Moses uh, uh, it charged them all to have no mercy on. So when you take all of this together, I think it starts to, uh, to look like a progression of real significant things that Jesus was doing to try to, to incorporate the Gentiles into his ministry. And the fact that he said, God only sent me to the lost children of Israel, seems to look more and more like a satirical statement and not just a statement of fact, because Jesus contradicts himself all through this context if he was really being serious when he said that. The good news is that the number of seven in the Bible not only signifies those seven nations, but it signifies fullness or completion. So the seven basketfuls represent the full and complete number of nations 
the good news is that God is not excluding anyone. All are invited to the, sup- to the supper, and there's bread enough for everyone. So today, we're 2,000 years down the road into Act 5. Yet we some, sometimes still revert to playing characters like we're in Act 3, showing mercy only to those who show mercy to us. Just like Jesus, when he was presented with a Canaanite woman pleading for her daughter, Jesus is waiting for our response. Just like he gave his disciples that day an opportunity to respond on their own, I think when we encounter these circumstances, Jesus waits for us to see what our response will be as well.